Welcome to Luffy's Lunch Break, the compilation show for guitar building enthusiasts. In this week's episode, Moon Guitars answers that question about why boutique guitars seem so expensive by looking back on Fender factory prices from 40 years ago. Lars Grape introduces a way to check for any problems in your guitar design. We've got a range of great tool tips from Garland String Instruments. We've got a make your own budget tools from Goff Rider Creations, looking at a, a tool that I'm finding invaluable in my workshop. Mr. Glynn's Pickups talks about Strat pickup heights. Petrek guitars work on an interesting Fender headstock repair. A bit of inspiration with beautiful fretwork from Bo Hannum. Mark Guterres shows us a no sanding lacquer finish. I've got a couple of quick tips of my own for Floyd Rose bridges. And there's an excerpt from the most recent Guitar Builders Collective podcast in which we discuss aesthetics versus ergonomics. Now, just before we start this episode, I want to let you know that you can find links to all of the different contributors in the video description below. Links off to their YouTube channels and their other social media pages and websites. There's also a link to a Luthier's Lunch Break playlist. You can subscribe to that to see all the past episodes and have notifications of the new ones. And if you're enjoying the show, don't forget to hit like, share this with your friends. You can give me a super thanks if you really like what I'm doing. But what would be great is if you subscribe to my channel, Devil and Sons Guitars. Okay, let's go on with the show. Hello guys, my name is Lars and on today's video we're going to talk about how to spot potential design mistake. So let's start with the first advice. Always double check your measurement, not with bridge width, scale length. Measure two or three times everything to make sure that you didn't make any structural mistake. My second advice is to make something like this. This is a cardboard copy of my design. Uh, I print this thing because I have the PDF project, but you can always uh, use parchment paper to copy your design and then cut this thing out without ruining the paper project that you did. And cut this thing is very useful because now you have something that is sort of 3D and it will make it a big difference even if it's this thin and you can actually see if the guitar is working right. Trust me, put this in a place where you can see it every day and you will see if there is something funny. Here I have the print of my first version of Ferrer, my seven string bass, and after a couple of days on having this thing on site, I noticed that this lower horn was a little too thin and it was funny to look, I didn't like this, and so, I could come back on the project because I didn't start the build yet and fix this mistake and now this base is one of my favorites. So wait a couple of days, have this on hand and you will see if there is something about the design that you actually don't like. Second thing that you can do is actually sit down with this and you can notice if the, um, the body is too big or maybe too small, if the lower horn is long enough so the guitar will not slip away while you practice, or you can see if this thing is too much in the way to reach the last fret on your fretboard. And also you can check if the S-stock is of the right dimension. Simply put this down and put the tuner in position and you will see if this works. Doing this type of stuff now will save you a lot of time and pain later. So trust me, do a cardboard copy, live with this for a couple of days and then you can see if the design is actually working for you. Now, I will see you in the last episode where we will talk on hand drawing versus computer drawing. Hi again everyone. I've got a few more for you this week. A couple of um, everyday objects and a couple of makeshift tools. Um, I'm aware I've been a bit long-winded in the past so I'm trying to up the pace a bit so uh, this will be a, a shorter episode. Uh, let's get right into it. Here's a quick tool or fixture you can make. Uh, sometimes you need to hold a guitar body for light operations like um, sanding or grain filling on the back or French polishing, things like that. Um, and you don't want to get out the full cradle that you might use for binding or, you know, that kind of thing. 
So I've made these beams, which I've lined with um, crubber. You know, it's this um, combination of cork and rubber, which is great stuff. And the dowels just fit in the dog holes like that. And I can tighten the vise up lightly. And it just holds it steady enough to be able to do that kind of operation. And it's very quick and easy. Lots of you will know this one, I'm sure, but um, if you follow builders in the US, you'll often hear them talking about naphtha, which they use to wipe down surfaces so it's a cleaner and degreaser. And as far as I know, we don't have it in Europe or the UK as such. But um, lighter fluid, I've found, if it isn't the same thing, it's very, very similar. I've never found anything that it hurts in the sense of, you know, if you've got a finish on, it won't dissolve it. I haven't found a finish that it um, dissolves and um, it's a good degreaser so um, it's not particularly cheap but then you don't need a lot of it normally so um, as a naphtha substitute lighter fuel is a good good bet. Here's another tool you might uh, like to think about making it's just um, split dowels I use just ordinary wood screws to um, screw them back together and I've sandwiched a piece of 80 grit Abranet um, mesh in, in here and it's great for necks, for shaping, doing the shoe shine kind of action, for getting an even, even curve on both sides of the, you know, a symmetrical shape basically. Sometimes during a build I need to draw a straight line between two points on a curved surface like a side of a guitar or something and even if you've got you know quite a bendy ruler like this one it's a bit too springy or it's not this one is not long enough um, what I found is I've got a piece of plastic here which I think is from a, a sort of table protector or something but the thing is it's got a machined straight edge and it's quite long so if, for example, I've got the height on a newly bent side, so not um, profiled, I've got the height of um, the heel and the tail marked at certain points and I want to join them up, I can use this, tape it down if necessary, and um, draw along the machine edge and I've got a perfectly straight line between my two points. Um, in the case of a side, obviously, I would profile it so the line wouldn't end up being straight but that's a, a starting point anyway just a useful way of being able to make a um, to follow a contour and draw a line along it well that was it for this time I'm sorry about the sound quality in one or two of the clips I'm still working on improving it I've got a new microphone now which I hope um, will make things a bit better for the next episode so until then, goodbye for now. Curtis here from Goth Rider Creations and welcome to another exciting episode of How to Make Your Own Luthery Tools on the Cheap. Now today we are going to make a centre finding ruler. Now for this all you will need is a ruler. Nice and simple. So first mask off all of the marking lines leaving only the numbers visible. Next Take a piece of sandpaper and carefully sand away all of the numbers. Unless you realise this is a stainless steel ruler and this is going to take you six years. In that case, mask off the rest of the area, 
take your favourite chrome spray paint, remove the cap and the secondary cap to stop small babies graffitiing or whatever. And then spray a nice thick coat of paint obscuring all of the numbers. In the meantime, take your other ruler and do the same process. Mask off the lines and carefully sand away all the numbers. Then, once you've removed your masking, take your sharpest sharpie and mark on the new numbers, starting with zero in the centre and the rest of the numbers corresponding moving out from there. And there you have it. I've done mine with a combination ruler and protractor to make it much easier to work on nut spacing. Now, speaking of nut spacing, does it give you a headache trying to work out the individual spacings for the strings? Do you give up and just use a calculator? Well, if that's the case, then why not make your own string spacing ruler? For this you will need another spare ruler and a very sharp knife. Now very carefully score on the positions of the strings. Then take your sharpest file and very carefully make your own notches to correspond with the string spacing. And there you have it. A little bit of pen to mark the either side of the nut and you're away. And here we are marking out the stainless steel ruler just so we don't leave anything unfinished. And there you have it, your very own centre finding ruler. OK everyone, take care, I'll see you next time. So you want a finish that is more durable than oil and wax, but you don't want to use a lacquer because you don't want to sand. That's okay, nobody wants to sand. And this is the way you do it. This is how you use a lacquer to get a durable finish with zero sanding. Step one, tongue oil. You only need one coat. And the whole point of this is to pop the grain. This is the immediate satisfaction we all love from oil. Let it sit, just follow the instructions, I think it's 30 minutes, and then wipe it off. And I mean wipe all of it off. Use multiple cotton rags and take it all off. You want it to get to a dull finish. It still has a sheen, it still popped the grain, but it's a nice dull finish. Next step is to use Steamax Satin Nitrocellulose Lacquer. I know what you're thinking, this won't stick to tongue oil, but it will. Don't worry. The beauty of Steamax Satin Nitro is you don't have to sand. Their website clearly states that it has some type of self-leveling flattener that requires no sanding. Instructions also say that all prior coats should be sanded, but guess what? We're going to ignore that. We're not going to sand any coat. Follow the instructions and warm up the lacquer. But otherwise, just spray it on. It's a rattle can. And here are our results. It looks just like an oil finish, or an oil and wax finish, and we didn't have to sand, not once. We get 
the durability of a lacquer. And all we had to do was use a rattle can. The process is pretty simple. Shoot, wait 10 minutes between coats, and repeat until the can is completely empty. Shoot however you like. I prefer to use gravity. I lay the body down flat, and I shoot the back and the sides. And I do a couple coats of that, and then turn it around and shoot the top and the sides. The sides usually get more nitro than the entire body, but that's okay because the end grain wants it. it soaks it up nicely and looks pretty awesome. It's almost impossible to get this set in nitro to run. I did have one run right there in the feral hole. And that was it. That was the only time it ever ran. The proof is in the pudding. And that's all I'm feeding you here. Delicious, sand-free pudding. I got this beautiful Stratocaster warmth neck in my workshop and my customer asked me to repair the cracks in the headstock. They was caused while he's turning in the screws for the tuners and, and the headstock cracked. My idea is to inject the glue as deep as possible. You see the cracks goes through the headstock. Very unusual for a Stratocaster. I wiggle it so that the glue gets really deep and then I take my vise that I have mounted on my workbench to clamp it down. Let it sit for one day. I'm using super glue to fill up the tiny gap. I let it dry for about two hours and then I start to sand it down with 400 grit till 800 grit. Uh, and the finish is with very fine steel wool so I can apply an oil finish on the neck. Now I'm installing the bushings from the tuners. Normally I will hammer them in, but in this case I decided to put it in my vise that I have mounted on my workbench and press them in, not causing the problem again of having a crack in a headstock. Finally I get to the conclusion that the bushings don't cause the crack in a headstock. It was another problem. It was the size of the holes for the fixing screws for the tuning packs. And after measuring out the correct diameter of the screws, I decided to make the holes a little bit oversized to reduce the pressure in the wood when I screw them in. If you like that kind of content, let me know uh, and see you next time. Thank you. people welcome to the workshop today it's the tricky subject of stratitis um, so I've been writing a blog about um, setting pickup height and I've got onto the subject of setting the height on strats and I just thought I'd demonstrate rather than carry on typing a long-winded explanation so I just want to show you the difference in sounds when you change the height of a strat pickup so this is a test guitar, as you can see, but we've got a, a strap pickup in the neck and that's what we're on. All the volumes, the volumes and tones are at full. So I'm just gonna show you how it sounds. So this is with the pickup wound away. So this is a less dynamic, more compressed sound um, and a bit smoother. So have a little listen. I'll try and do this so you can see what I'm playing. Um, <laughs> going to wind the pickup up so it's close to the strings. That would be a really good idea to edit this bit out. Yeah, I'll edit that out. Okay, so here we are and it's close to the strings. <laughs> There's more thwap. Um, it's more dynamic, it's less compressed. So if I do a little test with a dynamic, so if I play 
gently and then get harder. And then I go and do the same thing with a pickup low. Okay, so if I play gently. Right. Again, more editing. I'll edit this bit out so you don't have to sit through me twiddling my screwdriver. So now I've wound the pickup away from the strings. I'm going to try and play exactly how I played before. Hopefully, the little microphone over there could hear that. Brilliant. But I haven't finished. Because I haven't talked about the actual stratitis bit. More editing right here, eh? While well, I use a screwdriver. So I'm winding this pickup up and I'm putting it to where I would consider it to be too close to the string. Because I want to show you what happens when it is too close. So when you get the pickup too close to the string, you've got the magnet from the pickup and you've got the string. And the magnet wants to pull the string in towards it. So instead of the string vibrating in its really nice, smooth kind of way that it does, suddenly you've got two kids on a trampoline. You know, it's not a very fixed wave. It's doing all sorts of crazy things and someone's going to get double bounced. <clears throat> so the essence of that, or the, what, the outcome of that, is you get a funny wobbly note. And it's more up here, because when we play up here, the string is closer to the the uh, pick up the one we play down there. So have a listen. Hopefully you both hear this. Hear that? And the sustain drops off pretty quick because that magnet's trying to hold the string down. The string energy is pushing the mag is forcing the magnet away. Sorry, the string energy is allowing the string to escape from mag the magnetic field, but it's still being held down. There. <laughs> oscillation and we've got a funny wah sound going on. So that's straight like this. Playing it down here, we get a nice note because that string is further from the magnet when I play down there. So that can will hopefully help you set the height to what works for you. Now what I usually do, I usually set the height for me to a point where, so just do it by eye now, but a point where that stratitis, stratitis starts happening at around 14th fret. And then by the time you're here, it's horrible. My thinking is, I don't play those notes there on the bass strings. So this doesn't really happen on the treble strings. So on the bass strings, I'm not playing up there. And if I ever did, it would really just be a passing note. So for me, I set it so that it, it, it really starts coming in at the 12th fret. Hopefully I can demonstrate that. Yeah, it's starting to happen around there. That's how I like it. And I think really this is something that you need to set yourself. It's not a one size fits all. And the more information you have, the better. So hopefully I have armed you with some of that information there. Um, anyway, this is all about the blog, really, not about me talking. So thank you very much.
The Guitar Builders Collective is a group of like-minded people from all around the world at different stages of their guitar building journey. You can join us over on our forum to seek advice or share tips on guitar building processes, materials and tools, or just to share your builds. On YouTube, we have a regular podcast of Guitar Building Chat where you can join the live stream or watch back on past episodes. Our Instagram page shares posts of members' builds and links you direct to their accounts. And for those of you on Facebook, we've got a private group that you can join, share and chat along with. The Guitar Builders Collective is a welcome and open space for all, so do pop by and say hi. Yeah, it was something uh, Ola Strandberg once said in an interview that the problem with ergonomic guitars is that they're ugly. That I'm paraphrasing, obviously, and his words were something similar to that. And he literally said that's why he wanted to build something that was kind of beautiful and pretty and elegant. And I think there's kind of like this balance you have to do between ergonomic guitars and beauty and or elegance. And so if you kind of tilt it the other way and say, well, I'm just going to go for aesthetics, then the the, the beauty kind of grows, but you know the ergonomics kind of like fall down and you kind of never see them again. So yeah, I think the last two builds, like it was always about the arm, like on the you know, the touch points where your consumer is touching your guitar. Those are a little bit hard in the arm, but they look phenomenal. Yeah, well, it, 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 it makes perfect sense to me to, you know, to uh, lay out the expectations of what the, the, the driving force is here. So even with, you know, newer people, they realize, okay, this isn't, you know, I know ergonomics is not the goal here. You know, I, I wouldn't have thought of it as divisive. Um, I, I loved it actually. I was like, "That's that's." I, mm, I just loved the fact that you just leaned into that and, and you know made that the purpose. I, I wonder if the idea that ergonomic guitars aren't beautiful comes from the fact that we've been conditioned to think the Telecaster is beautiful or the <laughs> Strat is beautiful because that was the original. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hey, like. Because I, I, I def, like, like Scott's guitar shape, for example, is something that is, if you, if you haven't seen something like that before, I can understand why it would look weird and odd to look at. But I, I think it, it is a beautiful thing to look at because of the, the way it's shaped and the way it's structured. And the same with yours, Mark. Whereas um, uh, traditional strat and things, I, I, the only way I think about them aesthetically is with the color choices or the combination of the pickups and things. I never think about that shape and think that's a beautiful shape anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been like, I mean, as a guitar, as, as guitar culture, right? We've been indoctrinated from the beginning. Like the problem with guitar culture is that it's wrapped in tradition and then like deep fried in nostalgia, right? That's, that's the issue with like guitar culture. So it's really hard to escape like what is beautiful and what isn't. But on that point, I, I'm a strat guy, Daniel. Like I'm a, I'm totally a strat guy. Like I, I own way more strats than I do tellies. And it's like my go-to guitar. I, I've never built a strat because it's already there. Like there's no point in trying to reproduce that. But I, I don't consider it to be like ergonomic. And the issue I think with ergonomic guitars and them being kind of ugly. Is that the human body's ugly? Like we have to account for like our abdomen and our forearms, and we have to account for where our arms are resting. And if you think about the human anatomy and trying to build and design a guitar around human anatomy, it's gonna look weird. Um, but that's just because that's how we're built. So just for our last clip, which I thought was brilliant when I saw it on Instagram, I wanted to open Luffy's lunch break up to you. If you've found this episode interesting or inspiring, please let me know in the comments. Or even better, if you want to make some content for it, get in touch. I'm always looking for more contributors as we grow this show. What will really help us grow is if you share this in your forums with your friends, on your pages, etc. And don't forget to go and follow all the different builders. Their links are in the video description. So this last clip is from Moon Guitars. And it answers that question we often get as boutique builders about the price of guitars. 
One question I get pretty frequently online is, why are your guitars so expensive? So I wanted to show you guys a little bit of context. If you Google Fender's retail price list from 1983, which is 40 years ago, you can see they sold standard strats with a case for anywhere from $945 up to like $1150 for a nicer case. I plugged these prices into the US inflation calculator to get 2023 pricing, and you can see uh, I'm basically charging you know, right in between what they were charging for a factory guitar for my handmade guitars. Um, and that's not even factoring in the nicer materials or specs that I offer. So if anything, I'm undercharging for my work.